I was awake quite a long time last night because I was giddy. <laughs> Nothing gets my fire going like a renewal of the church. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And it's not a renewal of the church. It's a renewal of all this church and all the other churches who believe in Jesus Christ. So it is truly a celebratory day. My gospel reading for you this morning will come from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and I'll be reading 31 through 37. Um, it says 34, but I'm long-winded. Hear the words of John. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, they answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there is no place for you in my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. Here ends the words of the Lord. And I invite us to start this morning by looking at the screen. He had no idea that he was striking the match that would light up Western civilization. Carl Barth uh, makes the observation that Luther, when he posed the 95 Theses, was like a blind man climbing a tower in the church in the bell tower, and he began to lose his balance, and he reached out to grab something to stabilize himself, and what he grabbed in his blindness was, was the rope for the church bell, and accidentally awakened the whole town by the ringing of the bells. In many ways, it was the beginnings of the modern world, but there was something to that singular moment of the posting of the 95 Theses that not only changed church history, this changed world history for the centuries to come. And no longer now would human tradition and ecclesiastical councils, and even the Pope himself, be the authority in the church. The highest arbitrator in the church would now be, thus says the Lord, as it was recorded in the canon of written scripture. I'd like to say it's a dangerous book for Luther because it will kill you. It will take you as a sinner and will deliver you into Christ's death and then it will raise you up as a new person. He knew how serious this was, and he knew, as his critics had said to him, that he before God would have to answer the question, are you alone wise? 
He was the monk who changed the world. But there was one aspect of Martin Luther, for better or for worse, that never changed. Luther was a bullheaded man who was capable of moments of supreme self-confidence when he knew it was right and he was going to move ahead like a bull in a china shop. The problem with that kind of personality though is when they get hold of the wrong end of an argument or when they go off in the wrong direction, uh, the damage can be as spectacular as the greatness was spectacular. And yet this was the man, this was the man that God used to recapture the gospel. He restored the word of God, the Bible, to the center of Christian life and worship. He re-established the importance of family, the value of music, the dignity of human labor, but most significantly of all, he recovered the truth that a person's justification in the eyes of God comes by grace alone, through faith alone. I am absolutely certain that no power on, on earth, no force in this world can ever extinguish the kingdom of God, that uh, the church cannot and will not lose. The church of Christ will conquer all things. That's the hope that we have. He was the beginning and certainly not the end. Uh, following him, John Calvin, John Knox, and the rest of the reformers continued to look toward the Bible as the inherent truth by which to set their lives. There are said to be five solas that were used to enlighten ref reformers in the day. Sola fide, faith alone, faith alone, nothing else. Solo gratia, grace from God alone. Solus Christus, through Christ alone. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. And soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. The foundational set of principles central to our salvation. You know, Many people see the Protestant Reformation as a schism, as a separation of a falling away. Not many think of it as transformation, and certainly fewer still think of it in the term of deconstruction. I am on the side firmly of looking at what happened in the early church that brought you and I together today as merely an act of deconstruction, of taking down walls that separate us, not destroying, changing, moving on, moving out, and moving away. The Reformation of the world and specifically the church, was merely a trying to break down the walls so that we could be the one holy united church of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Can I get an amen? And I did. If we look at what we have in common with all Christians, we can view the Reformation as a universal church, reformed and reforming. What we have in common as Christian believers 
is the baptism, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the public reading of Scripture, the liturgical calendar, or the, the Christian year is how we celebrate together as Christians. And the book from which all truth comes. In particular, the book of Psalms, which John Calvin called, the book of Psalms is the anatomy of the human soul. Amen. Because it gave us the range of human emotions and made the Word of God tangible and relatable to, yes, even in 2018, you and I today. Solo gratia, by the grace of God, solo fide, by the faith that he has instilled in you, we are saved from our weak and helpless sinful condition, not by any of our own doing, but by God's free and amazing grace through the justifying, enormous work, solo Christus, of God's Son, Jesus Christ. We learn this through scripture, biblical truth, and so we cannot help but say solo de gloria, glory to God alone. And there you have the reason for the Reformation. Those five biblical, godly principles. And I believe that anyone who professes to be a living, breathing Christian in this world today could not take argue with those statements. We also learn this through the preaching of God's word. Preaching was at the heart of Reformation theology. Preaching. According to the Augsburg Confession that was written in 1530, the church is that place where the word of God is purely preached and the sacraments are duly administered. And in 1566, still before Martin pounded those theses on the wall, before that, 1566, the second Helvetic confession went, went even further. Said, Pre the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Now I'm going to pause here for a minute, because that makes me very nervous. Translating that, I believe the reformers were intending to say, and I'm going to talk about, I guess I'm going to talk about it right now. Okay. It's the office of preaching is a called profession. It's what separates us from the rest of the world. You know, you don't go hire in for a job, although that is a danger in this big wide world today, isn't it? Well, no, there's some sin. Preaching of the word of God is a called position, not called by the bishop or the pope or, or the district president or anybody else, called by God. This is not a continually pleasant condition for me. Most of it, is trying to combat my fear that I cannot give appropriate honor, wisdom, and enlightenment to the people who are standing and listening to me. That's all Luther was trying to say, gang. That was why he was so tormented. And he would pace the floor at night. Not because he didn't know what to say or actually in the later days that he was afraid to say it, because obviously he gave his life. But it was because he did not want to put words in God's mouth, so to speak. Yet, Reformation theology tried to do two things. 
the reformers were concerned that the Bible take the deepest root in the lives of the people. One more time on that. Why these gentlemen stood up, gave their lives, did what they did, not because they wanted to change the world. They wanted to change the lives of their hearers. And I didn't use listeners because you can do that passively. Their hearers so that they would have the word of God deeply rooted in themselves. We're trying to straighten out some facts here this morning, gang. The word of God was meant not just to be read, studied, translated, and meditated on. Here's what you're waiting for. It was meant to be embodied in the life and the worship of the church. Embodied. That means you have to live it. You can't sit here on Sunday, walk out, and go do something else, never think about it again. Luther felt strongly a call to a call to preaching and that it was a sacred trust between God and the preacher, and the preacher, and the congregation or the people. And he used the words, sacred trust. I take that literally. The motto of the Reformation soon became, after the first probably three years, reformed and reforming. The church is always meant to be undergoing spirit-led, scripture-based change. You ain't gonna like that one, are you? I'm gonna read that one again. God wrote that last night, I thought it was pretty good of him. The church is always meant to be undergoing spirit-led, that's Holy Spirit, scripture-based change. Do you see now why Luther had to do what he did? They didn't, the, the church, the ancient church in Rome did not want to change anything. They were very happy plugging along, doing the same thing in the same way, at the same time, all the time. Uh, let me break this little one to you. Today, our celebration serves as a reminder to never get content with the way things are. Isn't that a tough one for us? Because particularly in the church, because we feel that it's, it's the ancient ritual given from God through the centuries, Christianity has existed and never died or been snuffed out, so we must always do it this way. Are you really listening to God with your heart and your soul and your mind? That's why Luther had such a hard time and following him, Calvin, and following him in Scotland, Knox. And so here we all are, all right? That's not it. Making icons that can withstand all kinds of things and never budge is not what the Reformation is about. Rather, we are called as reformers to always be heeding the voice of God, each one of us. Asking God where we should go. Asking God what would he have us do next. You see, reformation is a natural process. It's an evolution, if you will. Just as in the days of Luther, Calvin, and Knox, our churches have forgotten the fullness and centrality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you come to church because you like the music, you better look again at why the church was formed. Now, I have a caveat here. We love our music. I mean, it is a blessing to me, personally. I think it's a blessing to this church, amen? And I try very hard to keep us on the right path of saying the reason God gave us that gift, and Luther did also, he, he put music back into the church is that's an ultimate way to praise God. And that's what it's about. If you're interested in singing an aria because you like your voice, we need to have a private conversation. 
Okay, you're with me. I know you are. We failed to live into the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in each and every one of us. And you know what? That's why we wear red. It's, again, it's not a fashion statement. Okay? I, people I know were wondering, why do we wear red, really? Why does, why does Pastor say, wear all your red? Well, yes, it's celebratory. We are celebrating our history. It's a reminder to you that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's why we wear red together as a community. It's to remind us that we are not people-led. We are Holy Spirit fire-led. And if we stay close to that Holy Spirit indwelling, you got him in you anyway, so you can't get rid of him. All right? You might as well exploit him in your being. Get close to that spirit and that fire in you so that you, like all those reformers, will be able to say, here I stand. I love those words. I pray to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that when I am called on, I will be able to say those words at the right place and the right time. And I'm going to ask you as a Christian believer to say to yourself, would I be willing to do it? That's the spiritual question for today. That's what the Reformation is about. There are no weak people in the Reformation movement. None. And it grew from one to two to three to thousands. But each one of those people needed to make a personal commitment to God to say, I can't just walk the, the talk the talk, I have got to walk the walk. That's what that phrase means. You can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian, we have a lovely church, it's decorated very nicely. You should hear the people sing, they are amazing. I just feel so uplifted when I go to church. Yes, yes. Why are you here? You better be here to open up your heart to the Word of God because it will change your life. You want life change? You don't need a psychologist. You don't even need a medical person right now. You need to open up your heart to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God who God already gave you. The Christian tradition at its core, this getting heavy. Christian tradition at its core is one of reformation. It didn't begin with Luther when he pounded those 595 complaints on the church door in Wittenberg. It began with a renegade Jewish rabbi. That's when the reformation began. He came on the scene and he started mucking up all the religious traditions of his day. <laughs> Jesus, the reformer. He healed the sick on the Sabbath in direct violation of the word of God. He touched unclean and unworthy and extended forgiveness to violators of the law. He overturned tables in the temple and spoke the truth to religious powers of his day, which ultimately caused his death. I invite anybody to contradict the fact that your Jesus was not a reformer. So you see, in 1500, as Luther came along and Calvin came along, they were just following in the role of their role model, Jesus Christ. When we say we are following Christ, we are following the greatest reformer that ever lived. Jesus told us then that when he left, he would send the Spirit to lead us forward in all truth. That's why you're wearing red. He left you the Holy Spirit of God to lead you in all truth. 
The implication is then that there is truth yet to be revealed. There are more tables to be overturned, more scripture to be explained. We are called to be listening to a fresh word from the Spirit. To be willing to move out of our comfort zone, to draw on our courage and our God to say first to ourselves and then to others, as Luther did, here I stand. And ultimately, as Jesus did, thy will be done. To God, be all the glory for your lives here and throughout eternity. And the Church of Jesus Christ said, Amen. <laughs>